S&P says the government is out for revenge, the Fair Home Fund is back open for business, and Charlie Munger is really smart. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show, folks. I'm Matt Kopenheffer, as always, here with David Hansen. Yes. <laughs> We've got a great show today, folks. As I said, we're going to be talking about Charlie Munger. We're going to be looking at some tweets, and we're going to be playing a little fool in the blank. But as always, David, we start with the headlines. Mm -hmm. We've got a pretty big one here to start off. In the Wall Street Journal, among many other outlets, it reported uh, yesterday that, the, that Bank of America is exiting it's uh, China, China banking stake. I'll read a little quote from the, from the article here. Bank of America first made its first investment in China Construction Bank in 2005, paying $3 billion for a 10% stake. Bank of America former chief executive Kenneth Lewis had pushed the bank to invest in China starting in a June 2005 trip to Beijing in which he held the 10% stake as a long-term investment. Not so long-term, eh? Mm, I guess not. Uh, you mentioned... 2005. And if you haven't been following Bank of America, following the story, you might think they bought a banking stake in 2005 and selling it today. They're probably taking a huge loss on this, right? Well, no, wrong. They, they took the stake in it. They've been selling it off gradually to gain more liquidity, to just to get more cash uh, for the bank in their liquidity position. But it didn't work out necessarily from a strategy perspective, but it was very lucrative from an actual returns perspective in terms of buying the shares and riding the boom of Chinese banking and now getting out now. So didn't work out on one on one hand, but it, it did on the other. What are your thoughts? I you know I, I'm always one to uh, to take a pot shot at Ken Lewis. I guess I, I wasn't a fan of some of his strategic decisions. This seems like one where the idea of investing in a Chinese bank was to build the business in China. Mm -hmm. So that has not worked out. That hasn't been the outcome here. However, like you said, the position made money, so it worked out in the end. And I think in terms of exiting the position now. I think it's good. I think the bank has much bigger issues to deal with here at home as opposed to continuing to worry about whether it can build a business in China. So take the money and run. I think it's a good idea. Right. It certainly makes sense to sell. And it's worth noting Bank of America is not the only one to take a stake in a Chinese bank and it not really to work out and to sell that off later for profit. We've seen Citigroup exit a lot of their stake in Chinese banks, Goldman Sachs with the same thing. So it's not just a Bank of America problem. It was the kind of the American banks as a whole went into China to see if they could like, like we've said, uh, get a strategic advantage there, learned they couldn't really do it, and they're, now they're all getting out for profit. So just kind of moving on. Number two headline. Number two, going again to the Wall Street Journal about S&P. S&P accuses U.S. of suing to avenge ratings drop. So this is kind of a confusing story. We have the U.S. government suing S&P for basically claiming pre-crisis shenanigans in terms of rating agencies and that hurt the banks that held those securities that were rated. They had to get bailed out. So it's kind of a, a messy situation. And now they're accusing the U.S. of being seeking revenge for this because they downgraded them in 2011 mm -hmm. for their ratings. What, what are your mess, mess, here? Messy is right. I mean, w when we think about the, the the blame game here and looking to the U.S. government and saying, oh, well, they're, they're just going after us because we downgraded them. That makes no sense. How did you not see, how could you not see this coming regardless of the, the downgrade of the U.S. debt rating? This was, this was coming. I mean, there was, there was so much, there was so much messiness around the, the, the ratings agencies, not just S&P, but also Moody's, Moody's as well. I, this was coming either way. And, and what's funny here is regardless of the outcome of the U.S.'s lawsuit against, uh, against S&P, mm -hmm. it doesn't look good for S&P either way. Because on the one hand, there was, as the U.S. is alleging, there was fraud and, and saying that they were artificially inflating, earn, uh, inflating ratings mm -hmm. to get business. Okay, so maybe that's wrong. Maybe the U.S. doesn't win that case. So what's the alternative? That they just gave bad high ratings. So I don't think this makes them look good either way you got it. That's true, but if I think about it from a shareholder perspective, if I own McGraw-Hill Financial, which is the parent company of S&P, or Moody's, I'm not sure if this really scares me that much. I think they said they were seeking five billion, so yes, big number, five billion. But we think about the rating agencies, there's not a lot of competition there. It's really a three-player industry with Fitch, Moody's, and S&P there. And when you look at McGraw-Hill, they're not just the rating, rating agency either. 
they have outside businesses with education, et cetera. So I don't know if this is a big long-term concern for me. I wouldn't necessarily be super excited about the rating agency business and the business model there. It's just like, like we've said and like we've seen, it's a little bit, there's some conflicts of interest there. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's in a business that I'd want to hold for the next 10, 15 years because it does seem like one that should change. But this specific suit, I don't know if it's a reason to sell McGraw-Hill. Well, I will note that we've seen Warren Buffett working down his position at Berkshire Hathaway in Moody's, mm -hmm. so maybe we'll he's kind of on the same page as you. Uh, number three headline from CNBC. The headline is Bad Breadth, 11 Scary Headwinds for Investors. I'll just call out one of them here, and the, the, the scary headwind is, the canary in the coal mine to me is J.P. Morgan Chase. 50 is the critical level, sort of like a purchase, purchase manager's index or PMI for investors below 50. And we are seeing the financial sector in contraction. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. It's a, it's, it's a stock price. It's the stock price for J.P. Morgan. So number one, I don't think 50, 50 one way or the other means anything for J.P. Morgan other than what does the stock market think of J.P. Morgan stock price at this given time. And as we've seen, and as we'd hope as investors, as investors we hope that the, the market can be irrational from time to time and, and push a stock away from its intrinsic value. For J.P. Morgan, if we're thinking about J.P. Morgan by itself, we should be worried about the bank, we should be worried about the business. What is the business worth, not what, the, what is the stock trading at? And so when we think about the financial sector as a whole, to say that the stock price for JP Morgan is a signal for the entire financial sector? It's completely arbitrary. JP Morgan made over six billion, I think, in quarterly profit, quarterly profit last quarter. So if the stock price drops below this arbitrary $50 level, I'd be buying more if there wasn't material reasons that it would hurt JP Morgan's business. I'll move on to the other, another headline or headwind that they had on there was, was the number nine one. It said, banks are raking in the profits, but strip out gains for reserving loan lost reserves, and it isn't looking that great. So yes, this is true. This is something that people come back to saying, bank profits look good, but a lot of that is just them releasing reserves. And I have a little bit of a problem with people saying that that shouldn't count as earnings because these reserves were past earnings that they set aside. So they took the hit before and now they're releasing. So it's not like they're just making these numbers up out of thin air. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is a certain point where they can't release anymore if it gets to a level that's kind of unsustainable there. But I don't think this is necessarily if, if we see loan, loan loss reserves start to cool down, I don't think that's necessarily a sign that bank profits are just going to go away and it's not going to be profitable anymore. I think you have to look at, okay, why are they releasing? If the environment's more favorable, then they can make better loans. They'll make more interest income on that. So I, I, it's, always, it's always hard to look at banks in isolation and be like, oh, this one thing means that banks are heading, heading downward. And I don't think that's the case with this. Unless you can use it to prove a point. Exactly. <laughs> so moving on to Charlie Munger. Over the weekend, Jason Swig, in his column uh, for, the, for the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. wrote a great column about, about Charlie Munger. It was uh, titled Lessons from an Investing Giant. And uh, he, he did a lot of talking about how, how rational Charlie Munger is and how that has, that has led to a lot of his success personally through, through many different endeavors, but then also helped the success of, of Berkshire Hathaway, mm -hmm. where he's uh, co-chairman with, uh, with Warren Buffett. And, and I, think, I, I think it's underestimated, I think a lot of people underestimate how big of an influence Charlie Munger, is, Charlie Munger has been on Warren Buffett. And Buffett gets a lot of the credit. Buffett is certainly the, the front man for Berkshire Hathaway and is, is on TV a lot more than Charlie Munger and is certainly a more pleasant character and, and more of that grandma uh, or gra grandpa, grandpa gosh darn home t homespun kind of guy. Charlie Munger's a little bit more acerbic and, and, uh, and a tougher, tougher kind of character. But I think he's been just such a huge role for, for, for Buffett and for Berkshire Hathaway. And I'll, I'll, I'll give two quotes here from Charlie Munger. And I think this goes a lot to his influence on Buffett. 
So first one is a great business at a fair price is superior to a fair business at a great price. I think a lot of people think that's probably Warren Buffett. A too. lot of people <laughs> do think that that's Warren Buffett and, and I think we've heard Warren Buffett say that mm -hmm. at times, but it was Munger's influence uh, on Buffett because Buffett was originally a, a disciple of Ben Graham, and right. Ben Graham was very much on the, the strict value adherence. And if you look at Buffett's early investing in, in his uh, partnership, in his investing partnership, which was basically his hedge fund, mm -hmm. it was very value focused. So then the, the other thing, the, the other quote from Munger here is, all intelligent investing is value investing, acquiring more than you are paying for. So that's just a reminder too, you, you go for this great company at a fair price kind of thing. But then you, you think, okay, well, maybe that's growth investing or a quality company. No, it's still value investing. Value investing is always buying something for less than it's worth uh, or buying something at a, at a, a price that's, that's valuable. And, and I think that this is, a, this is a good reminder and this is what Munger has taught Buffett. Mm -hmm. So where do you see people being irrational in the marketplace today? I'll give you another two for here. So number one, I, this won't surprise the regular viewers of our show, I think investors are being irrational about the banking sector. I think that there is such a fixation on what happened, on what happened in 2007, 2008, 2009, that there's a refusal to acknowledge what has happened. Mm -hmm. And that's 2010, 2011, 2012, and today. And look at the balance sheets look at the income statements, look what the banks are doing today. It is a very different environment. These are, these are now banks that are by and large run by different, well not, I shouldn't say by and large, but if we look at the, the worst case, uh, the worst participants, so in the banking sector, Bank of America, Citigroup, run by different people. Wells Fargo and JP Morgan actually did pretty well through the crisis, they're run by the same people. AIG, financial crisis to today, run by different people. So. I just, I think that there is irra irrationality looking at what, what happened then and, and staying fixed on that versus uh, taking a look at what happened today. Right. The second one is I think people are just being irrational about the market as a whole. I think there's so much praise for what I, what I would call wise pessimism. And, and that's the, the folks who sound very erudite talking about all the terrible things that could happen. And, and in theory, there, there are things that probably theoretically could happen. But, but they're things that, that sound so much more probable given what we just went through, as opposed to what's happening today and, and what we're looking at going forward. And so again, I think that's people being stuck in the past and, and they're being uh, much more focused on the people that, that are talking pessimism, mm -hmm. that are talking the things that would have been great to be listening to in 2006 and 2007. Right. How about you? Uh, I'm gonna kind of go off a, a similar theme there in terms of the market as a whole. I think if you ask most investors right now, how do you feel about the market? What are your thoughts on the valuation or what's your outlook going forward? I think most people would say, seems a little overheated, not super overvalued, but when there's a big pullback, man, am I gonna be running, running in there and buying up all these great businesses? Most people are saying that. It's, I think Morgan Housel, our colleague, wrote an article the other day that was saying, everyone calls himself a contrarian that they're gonna buy at the bottom but in reality, it's very, very hard to do that. And I think people are being irrational about how hard that actually is. And to give you some numbers just to show you how shocking it can be to buy at the bottom or to hold through the bottom, I have an example that goes back 20 years. Okay, so I'll throw up some graphics here so you can see the numbers. If we go back to September 1993, if you bought $10,000 worth of, a, of American Express stock in September of 1993, if we fast forward to 2007 September, so, so 14 years later, it's now worth 72,000. So you turned your $10,000 into 72,000. You are feeling- I'll take that. You are feeling awesome. I, I am feeling awesome okay, just now, thinking about it. Now we fast forward to 2009. Your $10,000 went from 72,000 down to 12,000. Okay, can we just stop here for a second? Your account said $72,000. It now says $12,000. And I'm feeling terrible. You are not I'm in feeling big, good. I'm in big trouble with and, and I think it's easy to look back and say, well, that's the time to buy. Everyone's gonna be buying there. And I think people are looking, and I'm not suggesting that we're gonna see a company like American Express fall like that again, or, or we see a, a market drop, that like, like we saw before between 35, 40%. But even something in the 10% range, I think people are underestimating how hard it is 
and the psychology behind actually going in and buying great businesses at those rock bottom prices. So I think you really have to have your mind right in terms of what are the businesses that I'm going to buy at when the market is down. And the last number I'll show you is if you held on to those $10,000, what they're worth today, 85,000. So you went down from tw to 12,000, to 10,000 to 12,000, back up to 85,000 because you held through. So it shows me two things, that you have to have a really thick skin when you lose that much money on paper, so not necessarily selling, and also the rewards if you don't sell and you continue to believe in those good businesses. I think everyone thinks that. I think people are being a little irrational how easy it is to do that. I think it's very, very hard. But I think if you stick to, to the principles that, that Munger talks about, that Buffett talks about, that we here at The Fool talk about, I think you can try to battle those forces a little bit more. So what do you, what do you think is, so, so to sum up, what do you think is easier? Do you think it's easier for people to jump in and be buyers at the bottom or to just be holders through all, all uh, come what may? Certainly easier to be, to be holders. I know you personally, you look at your portfolio about once every quarter. Yep. I think that's, that's probably pretty rare for most people. I think most people probably check it more. I think everyone would like to check it less to give them less anxiety. But if there was one thing I could advise, buy good companies and hold them. And when they're down, you just have to hold them because you can see with that example there, if you, you, didn't even have to, you didn't even have to double down in March 09. I'm just not hang suggesting on. you had to do that. You just had to hold on to what you originally bought 20 years ago, and you'd, you'd be up over eight times your money. Uh, so I think rather than trying to time the market there, find the good businesses. If the ones that are really good go on sale, then you buy more. But if you can't even stomach that, you continue to hold. All right. Heading on to our game for the day, we have a little fool in the blank today. Mm -hmm. And David, I will throw the first one at you. The first one is, blank is the largest holding in my portfolio. David, fool in the blank. Markel is the largest holding in my portfolio, the specialty wow. insurer. Some people call it the, the baby Berkshire. I guess that's what I'm hoping for. That's the best scenario in the long run. Sure. But it is the biggest holding in my portfolio. That might be a surprise to some. It's not a stock that you hear about on CNBC every day. You're not seeing it scrolling at the bottom of CNN money. But I think that's why I like it. It's a little bit under the radar in terms of not everyone knows about it. But when you look at the actual business, it performs great. It has performed great over the last 20 years from an insurance perspective and also an investment perspective. When I look at this company, I see huge potential over the next 10, 15 years. As a younger person, I, that's the type of company that I want to be a part of for the next 20, 30 years. Even we just looked at American Express before. That's a 20 year period. And you can see what a great company can do over that time. So. Markel is my biggest. I'm asking you to fool. You, you've got you've got baby Berkshire. I, I've got the real thing. I think uh, viewers of this show probably know what a big fan I am of Warren Buffett and what a big fan I am of the Berkshire business in general. So, not probably not a surprising answer for me. Right. Number two, if I had to sell one stock in my portfolio, it would be blank. David, fool in the blank. It's a tough one. We don't like to sell much stuff in our portfolio if we're comfortable holding the good business there. But if I had to sell one today, I would sell BB&T from my home state of North mm. Carolina. Uh, it's a well-run bank, uh, managed well through the crisis, but the valuation compared to some of the other valuations I'm seeing in the market today doesn't look as appealing. So it's not necessarily that I don't like BB&T and what they're doing. Strong consumer business, strong mortgage business, strong business banking, but the valuation, I think, I could potentially find more value in some of the big banks, like a Wells Fargo, JP Morgan. So not that I don't like BB&T, but if I had to sell one today, it would be BB&T. What say you? I would say we're, we're a financial show here, but this is my portfolio, and I would say Intel may have to go. It's, it's uh, there, there are positives to the business, but I think the, the, tran the, the transition of that industry has left Intel behind to some extent. They're, they're, they're catching up a little bit on the mobile side of the business, but they'll never have that stronghold on the mobile side of the business that they did on the desktop side. And meanwhile, the desktop business is not what it was and it's not gonna be growing the way it was. So there's a, there's a good, it's a cash generating machine. There's a nice dividend there. I think that's a lot of what I liked about it, but I had this idea that they would be able to move forward, grab the mobile business better than they did, 
And, and also another part of it is simply that if we can learn anything from, from Buffett, one of, the, one of the lessons that I take away from Buffett more than anything else is stick to your sweet spot, stick, stick to your comfort zone and what you really understand. Tech, the technology industry is not my, my personal sweet mm -hmm. spot. Uh, I've, I spent some time in the past working in the, in the tech industry, but it's just, it's not where I excel in terms of, of, of stock uh, and business understanding. Right. Finishing off here, if blank left his or her company and started a new public company, I would buy no questions asked. David, fool in that blank. I'm gonna give you one, uh, I think most viewers probably haven't heard of this guy. He flies under the radar for being a CEO of one of the major financial institutions out there, going with Richard Fairbank of Capital One. So when we think about the big banks, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Bank of America, these are not run by their founder. These were founded hundreds JP of years Morgan ago. JP Morgan isn't? That's, that's usually, <laughs> it's usually the case because they're hundreds of years old or more than 100 years old. But Richard Fairbank founded Capital One, took them public, the stock is up I think over 12 or 1200 percent since going public. That's not bad. Not bad. I would take that. Uh, and I've liked what he's done from a, w when you look at the returns perspective, obviously very impressive. But it hasn't been because of big buybacks, big dividends that are going to the, the shareholders, which can make some people a little bit nervous there. Capital One's widely grown and returned capital to shareholders because of acquisitions. And we think about banking acquisitions, think of the countrywides of the world. It makes you a little bit uneasy when banks make big acquisitions. But if there's, if there's one bank that's had a pretty impressive track record of making acquisitions and doing them well and creating value for shareholders, it's been Richard Fairbank and Capital One, so I'm going with him. This one will hit home for you. You just said that the largest holding in your portfolio is Markel. If Tom Gaynor, the CIO and president of Markel, left Markel and started a, a new public company, I would be a buyer. No questions asked, almost no questions asked. Well, one of the questions I'd have to ask is what kind of business it is. Tom Gaynor is a great investor, so if this was an investing-based business, some sort of fund or something like that, that would be right in his ballpark. If it was another insurance company, I would hope that he would pair up with, with a, you know, an, ins an insurer, somebody who's gonna run that, that business side while he does the investing. Certainly, I would not hope for that because although Markel is not the largest holding in my portfolio, I do own a lot of Markel. Markel without Tom Gaynor, I don't think has anywhere near the value and the excitement that Markel does with Tom Gaynor. So I don't hope that happens. Mm -hmm. But if it does, I would be following Tom Gaynor wherever he. So if he went, went to go start like a big department store like a J.C. Penney, you'd be like, I'm, I'm all in. <sighs> Maybe. I, 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 would, I would think about it very hard, although the experience uh, over at Sears Holdings um, that with uh, Eddie Lampert, that would, that would give me a little bit of pause if Tom Gaynor went that direction. But I think he's a very smart guy, so. As a, as a Markel shareholder, I hope he does not. I, same thing. Finishing off, we go to the Twitter sphere. David, why don't you kick us off with the first tweet here? The first tweet we have about the Fairholme Fund, Bruce Berkowitz, says, Berkowitz 2 at David Faber. B of A is going to look like Wells Fargo a few years from now, and Moynihan is a genius. That Moynihan is, is a genius. That is from <laughs> Kelly Evans at Kelly underscore Evans. I like this this, this that. must make you very happy, and I want to ask you a couple of questions from this. <laughs> Do you agree with him that Brian Moynihan is a genius? Genius was the, was the direct quote there. And second, the Fairholme Fund reopening, is this a fund, I know we usually like to pick individual stocks here, is this a fund that, that you're interested in that you think investors should take a look at? What are your thoughts? Well, right, I'll take the first one. Uh, Brian Moynihan is, I think he's been a good operator at Bank of America and done a lot of good things. Is he a genius? I don't know, let's give him another five years and, then, and, and we can revisit he's an Ivy that. guy, he's with you. Come on, you guys stand up for each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's, how, that's how we operate. As far as Fair Home Fund and whether that's a good investment for, 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 potential, for potential investors in the fund, I, it could be. I, I think it depends on what, what people have in their portfolio currently because one of the things that's very interesting about the Fair Home Fund is six stocks, just six, make up 91% mm -hmm. of Fairhome's portfolio. Those six are AIG, which is 44% according to Capital IQ, 44% of the portfolio. Bank of America, 16%. That's why he's talking about Bank of America here. Mm -hmm. Then you've got China Pacific Insurance, 11%. And then uh, Sears Holdings, St. Joe's, 
and Leucadia rounding it out. But you've got huge concentration there. Is that scary? I don't think so. I think that uh, the, the, understanding the businesses really well uh, can, can make concentration uh, allow, allow you to beat the market mm -hmm. um, as opposed to having tons of different businesses that you barely understand. And I'll share quickly a quote from Buffett here. This was from the 1993 letter to Berkshire Hathaway shareholders. He said, we believe that a policy of portfolio concentration may well decrease the risk if it raises, as it should, both the intensity with which the investor thinks about a business and the comfort level that he must feel with its economic characteristics before buying into it. Essentially saying, to concentrate your portfolio like that, you've got to understand the businesses really well. And when you understand the businesses really well, that leads to better investment results. So. I like Berkowitz's approach. Mm -hmm. I think it could be a good fund if, depending on your, your time frame, if you're one of those people that invests in a fund, checks in in a year and sees what the fund's doing, and you, and you pull your money because, why am I paying this guy a fee? He can't even beat the market. I don't know if this is the fund for you because I think, I think Berkowitz is the one who came out and says, I wish we didn't have to measure our performance on an annual basis. He's a much more longer term thinker here. Uh, so if you believe in him, he certainly has a good track record, what fund manager of the decade, in the 2000s, so great track record, but if you're gonna be an investor in this fund, it has to be for the very long term, not of one, two year, because like you said, a lot of these investments are, they take a while to play out. AIG, they've been on the road to recovery, still playing out though, same with Bank of America. Also, he has a small position in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. That could be a couple years to play out, so this is certainly not something that's gonna be a one year huge performance uh, guaranteed. Number two tweet, this is from BI Markets and the, the Twitter handle is at the money game. Uh, the tweet is chart of the day, falling earnings forecasts is an awful reason to sell stocks. Falling earnings forecasts, an awful reason to sell stocks. And we have the chart too, right? Do we have the chart? Do we have the chart? We don't have the chart. We'll see. <laughs> here's, here's from the article. Describe though. the, chart. The, the chart. the chart essentially shows earnings forecasts, and this, mm -hmm. this, is, this is looking at it, uh, I think it goes back to 1976, mm -hmm. all of the earnings forecasts. In January, forecasted earnings growth, very high, steadily falls off. Mm -hmm. From 14% uh, th to around 5%. To around 5%, and that's throughout the year. Here's a quote from, from the article. Go. There's the graph. Hey, there There's it the is. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Since 1976, the median year-over-year -year growth forecast in January for the full year ahead is 14%, but expectations on average decline throughout the year to closer to the 5% average EPS growth we have seen over the period. That's from Morgan Stanley's Adam Parker. So essentially, analysts start out every calendar year, and we should point out this is, on, this is just calendar year. They start out the calendar year very, very excited. 14% growth. We're going to have big growth this year. New Year's resolution. And then throughout the year, they sober up and sober up and sober up. Mm -hmm. And eventually, they, they hit the forecast that's essentially in line with what growth has actually been. Right. And then January rolls around again. It's d by December, they've come, they've come back down. They've had their come to Jesus moment. They've come back down. We're okay. We're, we're on track with average, uh, average historical growth. And then January comes along again. And, we're excited again. <laughs> and I think we're, we're seeing that right now as, as well. We're seeing analysts come up and be like, earnings growth may slow, earnings growth may slow. And look, we're heading into September now, and the year is winding on. So I think it, the chart kind of hits right on there. An awful reason to sell stocks. All right, David, take us out with the final. So the, the third one is a tweet that we tweeted out. It says, ask a fool, tweet us your question here, and we may answer it and feature it on our daily video show, Where the Money Is, which is what we're doing right now. And the Twitter handle is at TMF Financials. So we, at, we asked to uh, post your questions there, and we got this response from a, a follower, Mac, at Navy Blue Skies. And he says, fear over Syria, debt ceiling fight, interest rates higher, all in the next few weeks. Why should anyone be in the market? Matt, why should anyone be in the market? Those, those sound like good reasons, don't they? They sound like reasons. And, 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 and there, there, there certainly are people that are, that are tied up in knots over, over all of those things. But let me, let, me just, let me just say this. This is just a very, very small snippet. This is a very small tidbit. Wells Fargo has earned about $20 billion over the past 12 months. Berkshire Hathaway has earned about $18 billion over the last 12 months. Investing the way we look at it is about owning businesses 
and taking part in the profits that they're earning. And yes, some of those, if we think about interest rates increasing, there's some parts of the business, particularly at Wells Fargo and the other banks, that that might hurt. But we're talking about billions of dollars of profit falling to the bottom line. As a shareholder, as a potential shareholder in many different types of businesses, I want to be part of that. And so that's what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of, what's this business? Do I want to own this business? Do I want to own this business for 10 years? Not, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about Syria, what's going on over in Syria. Whether I'm owning Wells Fargo, not one of them. I agree. They, they're concerns, but I think you should look at them as concerns that should be opportunity. These aren't things that are going to materially impact a Wells Fargo. Okay, if interest rates went to 30% or not, that's a little crazy. If that's, interest rates went crazy, really crazy, there could certainly be some liquidity problems at some banks. I don't think Wells Fargo has any branches in Syria that I know of. Uh, and what was the other one? The debt ceiling. We've been through this before. It caused some, some chaos in the markets, but it's just noise. It's not material to the actual underlying businesses. So I'm with you. It's, if we see these concerns persist and weigh down the markets, take that as an opportunity to, to find some stocks that are on sale. I don't think this is a reason. Certainly you should not be pulling your money from the market over these fears, in my opinion. I think you should stay invested. Uh, so appreciate the question. Appreciate the concerns that are out there, but I don't think it's something that you should be acting and, on. And to be clear, you are not predicting 30% interest rates. Not yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. That's, that's yet to come. Maybe. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> All right, folks. For David Hansen, I'm Matt Kopenheffer. We'll be back here tomorrow. Thanks for watching.